the Leyland P7647V, a car that almost changed Australian automotive history. Back in the early 1970s, Leyland Australia, a part of British Leyland, decided to create a car to compete with big names like the Ford Falcon and Holden Kingswood. They wanted to make something special, not just a regular car, but one that could stand out in both luxury and performance. The P76 was born from this idea. It wasn't just designed in Australia. British engineers also had a hand in it. The car had some cool features for its time. It used rack and pinion steering, which gave drivers better control compared to what other cars had. It also came with power-assisted disc brakes on all models and a suspension system called McPherson Strut in the front, which made the ride smoother and easier to handle. But things weren't all smooth sailing. Leyland Australia didn't have a lot of money to work with, and they kept running into delays while designing and testing the car. To keep costs down, they had to use cheaper materials and parts. They also rushed to get the car out, which led to problems with quality later on. Even with these issues, when the P76 came out in 1973, people in the press seemed to like it at first. Now, let's talk about the 47 Vive. This was supposed to be a coupe version of the P76 sedan. Leyland Australia wanted to make a stylish, sporty car that was still practical and comfortable. They hoped it would be their star model, showing off the best they could do. But as they got closer to making it, the same money and production problems that hit the P76 sedan started affecting the 47V2. The 47V looked pretty cool. An Italian company called Michelotti designed it. It had two doors and a big hatchback at the back, which was pretty new at the time. This design made it easy to get into the car's roomy interior, so it was both good looking and practical. Under the hood, the 47V had a big 4.4 liter V8 engine that could produce 192 horsepower. This engine was based on a Rover V8, which Leyland had permission to use from General Motors. It was made of aluminum, so it was light, which helped the car perform better. The engine also had a single Bendix Stromberg carburetor, which made it simpler and easier to take care of. Inside, the 47V was made to be comfortable and useful. It could fit five adults with plenty of room for legs and heads. The back seats could be folded down to make a big storage area, which you could get to through the hatchback. This made the 47V one of the most practical coupes you could buy at the time. Leyland Australia planned to make three different types of the 47V. A basic one with a six-cylinder engine, the main 47V with the V8 engine, and a fancy version called the Tour de Force. The Tour de Force was supposed to be the luxury model, with extra features and a more powerful engine. But because Leyland was having money problems, they only managed to make a few of the V8 version before they had to stop the whole project. Making the P76 and 47V was tough from the start. Leyland Australia's factory in Zetland, Sydney, wasn't set up to make big cars like these. The factory was originally made for smaller cars, and the assembly line was too small for the P76 bodies. This caused a lot of problems, including damage to the car bodies as they moved along the line. To fix these issues, Leyland Australia set up a special place called the Rectification Center. This was where they checked and fixed the cars before sending them to dealers. It cost the company $2 million to set up and employ 60 skilled workers. Almost every car had to go through the center, which added a lot of time and cost to making each car. These production problems were made worse by the money troubles British Leyland was having. The company was dealing with poor management and worker disputes in both Australia and the UK. The oil crisis in 1973, which made fuel prices go up a lot, also hurt sales of big cars like the P76. Because of all this, Leyland Australia couldn't sell as many cars as they needed to, and they started losing money fast. By 1974, it was clear that Leyland Australia couldn't keep losing money. They decided to close the Zetland factory and stop making the P76 and 47V. This was really bad news for the workers at Leyland Australia, as many of them lost their jobs when the factory closed. It also meant that the 47V project would never be finished, as they had only made a few test models before the factory shut down. When the Zetland factory closed, the 47V project suddenly ended. They had only finished 10 47V cars when they stopped making them, and these cars were never fully approved for sale. Even so, Nine of these cars were sold at an auction in Sydney in 1975. 
The cars didn't have registration plates because they hadn't been fully tested for road use. Amazingly, all 1047V cars are still around today, making them some of the rarest and most wanted collector cars in Australia. 147V was sent to the UK for testing before the factory closed. Later, someone in New Zealand bought this car and it's still there today. Another 47V is on display at the Birdwood Mill Museum in South Australia. Leyland owns this car and people can go see it. The rest of the 47V cars are owned by private collectors in Australia. Sometimes these cars are shown at car shows and events where they get a lot of attention because they're so rare and unique. Even though there were a lot of problems when they were being made, the 47V has become an important part of Australian car history. It represents a time when the country's car industry was brave enough to try big, ambitious projects. The Ford Falcon XW GTHO, especially the Phase 1 and Phase 2 models, holds a special place in Australia's car history. These cars were built to win races and became famous for their power, limited numbers, and big impact on racing culture. Ford Australia wanted to be the best in the Australian Touring Car Championship, especially at the famous Bathurst 500 race. This led them to create the GTHO series, starting with the GTHO Phase 1 in 1969. The car was based on the regular XW Falcon, but Ford made big changes to make it faster on the track. The Phase 1 had a 351 cubic inch Windsor V8 engine that made about 290 horsepower. It came with a four-speed manual gearbox, giving drivers good control over all that power. Ford didn't stop at just making the engine better. They also improved the suspension, brakes, and made the car more aerodynamic. They added a shaker hood scoop that let cooler air into the engine, making it work better and produce more power. The GTHO also had a limited slip differential, which helped both rear wheels get power, especially when turning. This was really important for keeping high speeds around tricky turns at tracks like Mount Panorama where they held the Bathurst 500. The car also had a strong clutch and tougher drive shafts to handle all the force from the big V8 engine. Ford made the GTHO to compete with other fast cars like the Holden Monero GTS and Chrysler Valiant Pacer. They wanted a car that could not only keep up, but be the best on the track. The GTHO was designed to be great on the road and even better in races thanks to its powerful engine, better handling, and racing-inspired features. In 1970, Ford introduced the GTHO Phase 2, which was even better than the Phase 1. They replaced the Windsor V8 with a more powerful 351 cubic inch Cleveland V8 that could make 300 horsepower. This new engine had bigger valves, better combustion chambers, and a stronger design, making it perfect for high-performance driving. The Phase 2 wasn't just about a stronger engine. Ford made the whole car perform better. They put in a close-ratio, four-speed manual gearbox for quicker gear changes and better control at high speeds. The rear differential was upgraded to a 9-inch unit with a 3.50 to 1 final drive ratio, which made the car accelerate faster and reach a higher top speed. Ford also added a Holley 750 CFM carburetor to the Phase 2, which mixed fuel and air better, making the engine even more powerful. They improved the suspension with better shock absorbers and springs that could handle the stress of racing. The brakes were also upgraded with bigger, vented front discs for better stopping power, which was crucial for the high speeds the car could reach. The GTHO Phase 2 proved itself on the track, especially when it won the 1970 Bathurst 500 with Alan Moffat driving. This race was really tough, testing both speed and endurance, and the GTHO Phase 2 showed it was the best car out there. This win was a big moment in Australian motorsport history and made the GTHO famous as a top performance car. Ford only made 287 GTHO Phase 2 cars, which makes them rare and valuable today. Many of these cars were used for racing, which has made them even more valuable as they've become harder to find in good condition over time. The car also had distinctive stripes along the sides and super rude decals on the fenders, giving it a unique and intimidating look. The Subaru symbol was a fun nod to the car's Australian roots, representing both its speed and its connection to Australian car culture. Inside, 
the XW GTHO had all the features needed for a high performance car of its time. The dashboard had a full set of gauges, including a speedometer that went up to 140 miles per hour, a tachometer that went up to 6,000 revolutions per minute, and gauges for oil pressure, water temperature, and fuel level. These instruments were important for monitoring the car's performance, especially during races. The rest of the interior was pretty simple, focusing more on performance than comfort. Buyers could choose from different exterior colors, like candy apple red and diamond white, they could also add options like power steering and a radio, which were considered luxury items back then. But most buyers were more interested in how well the car performed, as the GTHO was mainly seen as a car for serious drivers. Today, the Ford Falcon XW GTHO is considered one of the most collectible muscle cars in Australia, and it's becoming more valuable as these cars get rarer. Its racing success Limited production numbers and powerful performance have made it a car that many collectors really want. The Holden HQSS, released in 1972, was a big deal for Australian car lovers. It was Holden's first try at making a four-door sports sedan, which was pretty new back then. Before this, Holden's fast cars were mostly two-door models like the Monaro. They decided to make a four-door version because more people wanted cars that were both quick and practical. Holden took their basic Belmont model and turned it into something special. They put in a 253 cubic inch V8 engine that could make about 185 horsepower. This engine was already known to be reliable. They paired it with a four-speed manual gearbox called the M20. With this setup, the HQSS could go from 0 to 60 miles per hour in about 9 to 10 seconds and do a quarter mile in around 17 seconds. At first, Holden thought they'd only make 1,500 of these cars, but people loved them so much that they sold out in just a week. This surprised Holden, so they made 1,300 more, bringing the total to 2,800. The HQSS cost about $3,500, which was a price many people could afford. The HQSS looked different from other Holdens. You could get it in some really eye-catching colors like infrared, ultraviolet, and let us alone. These colors were pretty bold for the time. The car also had a black grille, special guards on the sides, and rally wheels. It had stripes and badges too, which made it look even sportier. Inside, the HQSS had bucket seats, which weren't common in four-door cars back then. These seats were good for fast driving. They were covered in a pattern called houndstooth, which was popular in the 1970s. Some later models had plain black seats because they ran out of the houndstooth material. The dashboard and steering wheel came from the Monaro, which was known for being a fast car. The HQSS became very popular very quickly. Even after making more of them, Holden still couldn't keep up with how many people wanted to buy one. It was popular because it was affordable, practical, and fast all at the same time. It was good for everyday driving, but also fun for weekend trips. Today, car fans see the HQSS as an important part of Holden's history. It was the start of Holden making four-door sports sedans, which became a big part of what they did later on. The SS badge became known for fast Holdens after this. Now, people who collect cars really want to find HQSS models because they're rare and important to Australian car history.